Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar titled Understanding the Peripheral Nervous System. I'm Sarah McFarlane, and I'm pleased to be your host for today's event. This is the second of four events in the Teaching Anatomy and Physiology series, which has been made possible by AD Instruments and the Human Anatomy and Physiology Society. So a big thank you to them for their support. Joining us today, we're very fortunate to have Mark Nielsen, a professor of biology and an animation wizard when it comes to teaching anatomy. He will discuss the evolutionary and developmental patterns that clarify the structural organization of the peripheral nervous system. Before we get started, I would just like to share a few housekeeping notes to help you get the most out of the webinar today. First, this webinar is being recorded and resources will be made available following the event. Next, if the webinar panels look too big or too small, you can zoom in or out in your internet browser to adjust the viewing area. You can also resize some of these panels or make the media panel full screen. Please send us questions, thoughts, and comments using the Ask a Question box next to the media window at any time. You can also take a look at the resources panel where you'll find a few links associated with today's event. We will also be running a number of audience polls during the webinar and a survey at the end, so please chime in and share your perspectives with us. And finally, if you do happen to experience any technical issues during the event, the easy fix tends to be a simple refresh of the browser. This should fix your um, issues, but if it does not, please reach out to us using the Ask a Question panel and our team will help you get back up and running. So before we get started, I'm just going to run a quick audience poll here, and we would really appreciate your participation. Um, so are you currently a HAPS member? Yes or no? And as we wait for you to answer that, I will move on to Mark's presentation. All right. So um, I'm very excited to welcome Mark Nielsen. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Welcome. I am uh, very excited to be here today and have this opportunity to talk to you about understanding the peripheral nervous system. And I'm trying, I want to try to share with you some elegant patterns of evolution and development to gain a better understanding both for ourselves and also hopefully to better teach our students this interesting network of wires. So the peripheral nervous system at its most complex is an amazing network of wires that we call cranial nerves and spinal nerves that come off the brain stem and the spinal cord and branch out to every peripheral tissue, innervating muscles and glands, bringing in sensory input from all parts of our body. But even through this most complex set of wires, if we can look at them a little more simply, we realize that they're basically pretty similar branching structures that arise from both the brainstem as the 12 cranial nerves and from the spinal cord as the 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And here, if we look at them, this is the core to all that more complex branching. It all starts here. And from, from this point forward, it's just branching to different places. But if we look at it like this, we can see that there's some kind of basic patterns going on. So let's, let's pose some questions though. I think a lot of times we don't really ask the questions that need to be asked to gain a true understanding of these structures. So I'm gonna pose a series of questions, and then we're gonna look at some developmental and evolutionary beginnings to these systems. And then we'll see if through kind of these elegant patterns that we learn, if we can easily answer the questions. So let's pose some why questions to start with. Why do all the spinal nerves, you know, from the very first cervical one, all the way to the coccygeal, spinal nerve, all look basically the same. They all have the basic similar pattern of anatomy. Why do the dorsal roots have a ganglion and the ventral roots do not? 
why is there a white communicating ramus only at the T1 to L2 spinal nerve levels and none other, no other levels? Why do all spinal nerve levels have a gray communicating ramus? Why does a parasympathetic splenic nerve arise from the ventral ramus of spinal nerves S2, 3, and 4, but at no other spinal levels? Why is the sympathetic output thoracolumbar in origin? And the parasympathetic output craniosacral in origin. Why is the sympathetic output much more widespread than the parasympathetic output? Why are there two motor neurons in the autonomic pathways, preganglionic neurons and postganglionic neurons? Why are there different types of autonomic ganglia? Sympathetic trunk ganglia, sympathetic prevertebral ganglia, and then parasympathetic ganglia. Now, how are cranial and spinal nerves related? Or are they related? And which group is more derived? cranial nerves or spinal nerves? So this is a group of interesting questions that I, I, I honestly ask, can you answer these? These are things that students might ask. They're curious questions that deserve to be answered and are easy to ask because they're things that you know are different. When we look at the basic of anatomy of the spinal nerves or compare spinal and cranial nerves, so let's, let's see what we can learn and follow some development. And then we'll come back, circle back, and see if we can answer these questions we've posed. I want to begin by looking at some developmental anatomy. We're going to look at the embryonic body plan. In my mind, I just don't understand how you can really understand anatomy if you don't understand developmental anatomy. You don't have to go into tons of embryological background. You just learn some basics of the embryo because the embryo has anatomy just like we do. And that anatomy is what gives rise to our anatomy. And if you can learn a few elements of embryonic anatomy and see how that transitions into the adult anatomy, you can go a long ways and you can really then understand you know, our anatomy. So, so let's begin. <clears throat> Here's an embryo. To the left, we've got a nice real picture, kind of a drawing in the middle, and then I've sectioned through the drawing to the right. This is about a four-week embryo, starting into the fifth week. It's only about a little bit over a centimeter in size, so we're not talking about a big, a big thing here. Now, <clears throat> let's, let's name some parts. I'm going to go over to this sectioned embryo first. And I want you to just see some real basic stuff. So let's begin with the body wall. The embryo has a body wall. Okay, that body wall surrounds a body cavity. That body cavity supports and suspends within it a gut tube. So what we see, and this is true of the vertebrate body from its embryonic beginnings to its adult form, the tube and the tube body plan of vertebrates. Let's add a few more pieces to our knowledge here. To either side of the suspended gut tube kind of bulging into the body cavity are the urogenital ridges, what we call intermediate mesoderm. Very important structures, kind of sitting dorsal laterally in the wall, are the somites. These are segmental blocks, serial homologs, that you can even see on the surface of the embryos. They project outward on either side of the midline. 
in between those is the neural tube and its associated neural crest. Beneath that, you can see a notochord, a support rod in the primitive embryo, the early embryo. Below that, the dorsal blood vessels and all that's kind of in this wall-like structure. A couple final things, not so important to our story today, are the branchial or pharyngeal arches, a heart bulge, very prominent, and developing limb buds, okay, the precursors of our limbs. That's some simple embryonic anatomy establish this basic vertebrate body plan. And those are features of the vertebrates. If you know that anatomy, you can build any aspect of a body. The key to our kind of postcranial development and the spinal nervous system, let's make a section through the embryo, pull out a section from the wall, and we're gonna focus on the somites. These serially homologous blocks create the segmented vertebrate body. And I want you to just really understand this because this is gonna drive a lot of nervous development. So let's, let's look at the parts of a somite. And this is a diagrammatic somite. I'm just trying to help you kind of understand the basic building blocks that arise from here. We see a group of cells that form called the sclerotome. Opposite that, more superficial, is a dermatome. And then in the middle, we have what's called the myotome, which we can subdivide into a ventral hypomere in red and a dorsal epimere in purple. These are populations of developing and differentiating cell masses, and they're the same in every cell mite. That's happening all along the embryonic trunk on either side. What we want to do is follow the migration of those cells. So notice the sclerotome migrates toward the neural tube and notochord, kind of creating cell masses that are going to go and wrap around and protect the neural tube. This is happening at every segment. And these cell mites are separated from each other. You're doing this at one segment, then there's a little gap, then another segment all the way up and down the body. The dermatome migrates towards the surface, towards the epithelial ectoderm on the surface that's forming the epidermis, and this is headed out under and spreading under that. The myotome migrates in two waves, one more dorsal, the epimere in purple, and one more ventral, the hypomere in red. And so we create these migratory patterns at every single segment of the body that are basically identical. All of them doing this exact same thing from just below the head all the way down to the tail end of the embryo. What is the result of this development? Well, let's look and see as these cells migrate, start to differentiate, they start to form a segmental pattern of bone, muscle, and skin. So the sclerotome migrates out and it's gonna become the body of the vertebrae, the arch and transverse spinous process of the vertebrae and the rib elements. At every level, you're creating your costovertebral anatomy. The dermatome migrating towards the surface, and I've kind of represented as this darkish pink color, sitting just beneath, beneath the stratified squamous epidermis that's developing from the ectoderm to become the dermis and hypodermis. We have the myotome migrating into two groups. The epimere migrates dorsal to the developing vertebral column to form what we could call our epaxial muscles, epiaxial, above the axis. So these become the extensors of the vertebral column. 
the hypaxial muscle group arising from the hypomere establishes a very, very cool pattern. A subvertebral muscle, a four-layered lateral wall, and a ventral muscle. And this is true from the neck, through the thorax, through the abdomen, and down into the pelvis. One final thing that I would just throw out here is that in regions where the limb buds form, I've represented here in blue muscles migrating both dorsal and ventral to the developing limb bones. All of that also comes from the hypomere. Okay, the same origin as these hypaxial muscles in the wall, in the trunk wall, that's where all limb muscles also come from. And so that's kind of this pattern of development resulting from somitic migrations and differentiation and starting to form our adult structures. Now that we have a basic feel for postcranial anatomy, let's look at creating the spinal nerves. We'll begin by just looking at our section again. So here's our little section. And notice I've put in those dorsal blood vessels. And notice how I've divided it into, I'm gonna look at a couple different levels. So this is levels S2, 3, and 4. And this side represents levels T1 down through L2. And I've put in that dorsal blood vessel. And I want you to understand that there's really three main branches that come off of it. Okay, there's always a branch at every somatic segment into the somite, a branch into the intermediate mesoderm, the urogenital ridge, and branches that go down to the gut tube. Okay, and so that's a pattern. These branches to the somites come off at every level. The ones into the gut tube and the urogenital ridge are not necessarily at every segmental level corresponding with these. The other key thing I want you to see is the neural crest. So I've left, I've represented our neural crest tissue to the side of the neural tube as groups of cells. These are cells that are gonna be very important in our story and we're gonna follow their early development and migration Start with the neural crest. Notice how they migrate. Some of them don't migrate. They stay put up here dorsal lateral to the nerve tube, whereas others migrate. And what these migrating neural crest cells are seeking is developing smooth muscle. Developing smooth muscle. Now, some of them are headed towards developing smooth muscle in blood vessels while others are headed towards developing smooth muscle in the gut tube. Cardiovascular smooth muscle, gut tube smooth muscle. So we get these distinct migrations. Those set up what we would call then ganglia in our peripheral nervous system. So let's name some of these ganglia that arise from these migrations. So first off, the ones that stay put and don't migrate, that's going to become your spinal ganglion, what we often call the dorsal root ganglion. Technically, the preferred name now is spinal ganglia. Then we see the ganglia that are going to form the whole sympathetic trunk chain. So that sympathetic trunk, which would be moving in and out of our picture here, has ganglia all along the way, right? So these become those sympathetic trunk ganglia. And those are cells that are migrating to the smooth muscle in blood vessels that are headed back into the somite. The next migration forms what we call prevertebral ganglia. These are the, the crest cells that are migrating down ventral to the aorta, where it's giving branches into the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut. So these are forming what we call the prevertebral ganglion, like the celiac, superior mesenteric, inferior mesenteric, aortico-renal, 
So they're going to, towards the smooth muscle and blood vessels to the gut tube and the kidneys. And then, so those are all migrations towards cardiovascular smooth muscle. Now, the final migration is what we're going to call a parasympathetic ganglia. And in the postcranial body, you never really see these as ganglia. These are often what we call intramural ganglia, where these cell bodies migrate into the wall of the gut tube and then form short axons to the smooth muscle of the gut tube and the glands of the gut tube, not to blood vessels, to the gut tube. Okay, so those are crest migrations. So the crest either stays put or migrates to two sources of smooth muscle, cardiovascular smooth muscle, gut tube smooth muscle. The final player we need to add to the story, neural tube neurons. So these neural tube neurons, they form in the ventral part of the developing tube. Those are gonna be the key to our story. And so those are the players. That's the developing neurons that are gonna create the entire postcranial spinal nervous system. So let's watch them develop. We've set the stage. I'm gonna remove the blood vessels just to make things less messy as we build this up and watch. We're gonna grow out axons and make connections from these cell bodies that have migrated into place. Let's start with somatic sensory neurons. The cell bodies grow peripherally into the somite and centrally into the neural tube. These become the pseudo-unipolar neurons of the spinal or dorsal root ganglion. And these are gathering sensory information from the body wall too, and bringing that into the spinal cord, the central nervous system. Also from this dorsal root region, there's some visceral sensory neurons. These form pathways to the gut tube, to the gut tube. So look what we've done with the non-migratory crest cells. We've created axonal extensions into the body tube and the gut tube to gather information. Next is look at the migratory crest cells. The migratory crest cells, first off, we said some went to form those sympathetic trunk ganglia. So let's look at some sympathetic postganglionic neurons that follow smooth muscle, developing blood vessels, back to the somite. Okay, so they're following those blood vessels that came off the aorta and went back into the somite, and this happens segmentally at every segment of the body because there's a somite at every segment of the body, and these neurons were set up segmentally into that somite. Okay, following those blood vessels, those segmental blood vessels. You can see a segmental blood vessel arose off the aorta into every somite. How about sympathetic postganglionic neurons that go to the gut or into the pelvic region? You know, the pelvic organs. Well, they just run down through the mesentery. So in the pelvic organs, they can come off the sympathetic trunk, head into the down the mesentery, you know, into gut organs in the pelvis. And in the abdominal region, say, they come from those prevertebral ganglia that were following the blood vessels, see, down into the... So again, these are not going to the gut. These are following blood vessels. They're innervating the smooth muscle in blood vessels. And when they do enter the gut, they're innervating arterioles and the smooth muscle of blood vessels, not the gut tube. And then finally, we have those parasympathetic postganglionic neurons. Those are the ones that migrated into the gut wall. You see them way down here 
and they send axons to the circular layer, the longitudinal layer, the you know, muscularis mucosae, the glands of the gut, to the gut wall itself. So that is the crest cells. See, that's the crest cell story. Look what we've set up, postganglionics of the autonomic system, somatic sensory, visceral sensory. Now, all we have to do in this elegant story, look how simple it is. We're built, it's starting to create the spinal nervous system. We just need to add the motor component. And those are the ventral tube cells. So let's start and put in the sympathetic preganglionic neurons. Now, I want you to notice that they only arise from T1 to L2. The only place we find preganglionic sympathetics is T1 to L2. And what do they do? Well, look at it. They grow out and they seek the postganglionic crest cells. The postganglionic crest cells. So they establish pathways to the postganglionic crest cells. Okay, now to get to one of the postganglionic crest cells that's sympathetic here, they would have to enter and go down and up the trunk, which we just can't see in this section. So they would come down the trunk from here and get to that guy, see? Let's do the parasympathetic preganglionic. The only place they come from in the spinal anatomy is S2, 3, and 4. So they exit and head down through the mesentery all the way down to innervate those postganglionic neurons of the parasympathetic system that were going to the gut tube. Now, somatic skeletal neurons is the final piece to our puzzle. So we put in those guys and what do they do? They just go out into the somite at every level to both the epimere and the hypomere to innervate the muscles that are going to develop and create the epaxial and hypaxial muscle wall. And at limb levels, they even send neurons into the muscles of the limb uh, that's forming. So look what we've just created. There is our system. I hope everyone recognizes that's just a nice spinal nerve anatomy. Let's make sure you can recognize what you're seeing. Can we label it? Let's see. Look at that. What's that? Everybody think to yourself, what's that? Oh, there's my dorsal root. What's this right here? There's my spinal or dorsal root ganglion. What's this over here? And it's on both sides. I'm just trying not to overcrowd things. Well, there's my ventral root. What's this? Oh, that's the spinal nerve trunk where the two roots come together. And then look at here. Oh, headed to the epimere region of the somite. That's my dorsal ramus. Headed to the hypomere region. There's my ventral ramus. Oh, look at the spinal nerve. There's the base of, of any spinal nerve right there. Okay. Now look at that. What's that coming off kind of the ventral ramus near the trunk and headed over towards the sympathetic trunk? Oh, there's my white communicating ramus. And what's that? There's my gray communicating ramus. And I also have one of those on the other side. Notice again, I don't have a white ramus only at T1 to L2, gray ramus at every level. What's this? Well, there's the sympathetic trunk and it's ganglia. See, they would be running in and out of our picture. Okay, there's a parasympathetic splanchnic, what we call a pelvic parasympathetic splanchnic nerve. And there's the sympathetic splanchnic nerves. And there's our prevertebral ganglion, like the celiac or the superior mesenteric or the inferior mesenteric or the aortic or renal. And then here are those terminal parasympathetic ganglia, or those intramural ganglia in the wall of the gut tube. So there's your spinal nerve. There's your whole postcranial anatomy right there. With a simple, elegant understanding of a few crest cells and tube cells, 
we created that and we understand the logic in it and why it is the way it is. And so we morph that back in where we now see the relationships of the migrating somites. And there you go. See, dorsal ramus is going to the epaxial muscles. Ventral ramus is running around through the hypaxial muscles. Notice how this is a very cool pattern. It always sits between, see, there's four layers. It's always between the middle, these two inner layers. That's a pattern throughout your whole body from the neck to the pelvis. Here's your gray rami coming up. Notice the white rami is only on the T1 to L2 side. There's your sympathetic trunks, sympathetic splanchnics, prevertebral ganglia, parasympathetic splanchnic nerve, dorsal ventral roots, dorsal ganglia. And see, it's all right there. That's what we just built and we perfectly understand the logic behind it. Now, and if you went to higher level, C1 to C8 or T3, you know, where there's non-autonomic levels, it's even simpler. And you should stop this movie sometime and see if you can work through that. Same logic, okay? That would just be those levels above T1 and so forth. Now, let me introduce you to a little comparative anatomy and then we'll see if we answered our questions. What are the two most prominent distributions of smooth muscle in the body? Well, cardiovascular system and the digestive system. We've already alluded to that, okay? So if you look at the development of those systems in the vertebra vertebrate embryo, let's look at it. Cardiovascular development. Well, guess what? We're not the first vertebrate embryos. 500 million years ago when the fishes evolved and all the way through the amphibians, reptiles, and birds, they laid eggs that depended on having a good yolk supply because they weren't being nourished by hooking to a uterine environment like the mammals. And so this yolk sac was the source of all early blood vessel formation. The yolk sac was an extension of the gut tube in the belly region of the embryo. And blood vessels from that yolk sac delivered the nutrients to the developing embryo. So the earliest formation of blood vessels and a heart tube that then could move this nutrition around was right in the center region of the embryo. And that's an ancient story in vertebrates. And it still holds true even in our embryos. Now, notice the location of those then developing blood vessels, center of the body. Well, the neurons that came off the central nervous system seeking the postganglionic cells that were going to the smooth muscle of the developing blood vessels arose from the center part of the embryo. What did anatomists call this innervation? The thoracolumbar output or sympathetic. Pretty cool. Innervation of blood vessels. That's what the sympathetic system's about. If you understand that, you know the sympathetic pathways. Everything about the sympathetic pathways makes sense because they're going to smooth muscle of blood vessels. The gut tube, on the other hand, because the yolk sac was an extension of the gut tube, the gut tube was really slow to form in the center of the body. And the gut tube formed first at the head end where there was gills and glandular formation going on and the tail end where there was cloacal and genitalia and allantoic stalks forming. And so the two ends is where the gut, smooth, gut tube smooth muscle first starts to form. And so guess what? The preganglionic neurons that were seeking the postganglionics because the postganglionics were seeking the smooth muscle in the blood vessels, well, they came from cranial and sacral regions. So what did anatomists call that? The cranial sacral output or parasympathetic. And that's the bottom line. If you really want to understand the autonomic nervous system, you have to understand that the thoracolumbar output or sympathetic primarily innervates cardiovascular smooth muscle, 
whereas the parasympathetic innervates gut tube smooth muscle. Look at any chart in a physiology book and look at just the main things that blood, 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 blood. And if the blood vessels could get out into the skin or out into the muscles, they could now bring that sympathetic out there. But look where the parasympathetic is. Gut, only in the gut, none, 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 everywhere else. And again, it's just understanding the development. And if you know that, then the pathways of the two systems make so much more sense. Did we answer the questions? Let's just kind of conclude quickly by seeing, did we answer the questions? Why do all the spinal nerves have the same basic structure from C1 to the coccygeal? The somite. It was those serially segmental somites that drove the same developmental innervation pattern to their epimere and their hypomere, creating a segmentally looking spinal nerve. Why do the dorsal roots have a ganglion and the ventral roots do not? Well, remember, those were the crest cells that stayed put and became all the sensory output, both somatic and visceral. And so those were cells outside the neural tube. And that created the dorsal pathway, the sensory root. Why is there a white communicating ramus only at the T1 to L2 spinal levels? Well, just as we saw a site of initial blood vessel development and its innervation was in the center of the embryo around the yolk sac and developing heart tube. So all preganglionic output to everywhere. Look at how it spreads everywhere, but it all emanates from T1 to L2. Why do all spinal nerve levels have a gray communicating ramus? Well, remember the postganglionics that were seeking the blood vessels that we call the segmental branches of the aorta back into the somite occurred at every level because there was a somite at every level. So you had to send blood vessels into every level. So you had to send postganglionic neurons to innervate those blood vessels. Those are the sympathetic trunk ganglia and the gray communicating rami. That's what the gray communicating ramus is. The path of the postganglionics to the blood vessels. Why does a parasympathetic splanchnic nerve arise from the ventral rami? of spinal nerves S2 and S4. Well, again, we learned that site of initial gut tube smooth muscle development was craniosacral. So the cranial is going to be, the cranial part is going to be cranial nerves, which we're not addressing here, but the spinal part is those sacral levels. Okay, that's that output to that end of the gut tube. Why is the sympathetic output thoracolumbar in origin and the parasympathetic output cranial sacral? And again, that's just, that's it's an early vertebrate embryo story that we just saw. Okay. Sympathetic thoracolumbar cardiovascular smooth muscle. That's what it's innervating. Parasympathetic gut tube smooth muscle, cranial sacral. That's what it's innervating. Why is the sympathetic output much more widespread than the parasympathetic? Well, guess, you guys tell me. Yeah, blood vessels are everywhere. That's what the sympathetic's innervating. The gut tube isn't. It's kind of limited to the body cavity. Why are there two motor neurons in the autonomic pathway? Well, remember, Smooth muscle in vessels and the gut tube were developing somewhat remotely from the neural tube. And so those migrating crest cells were seeking that smooth muscle, whether it be in blood vessels or in the gut tube. Now, as they started migrating towards those, then neural tube cells extended out axons that sought out the migrating crest cells. Therefore, the autonomic nervous chain. 
preganglionic, postganglionic. Why are there different types of autonomic ganglia? And again, think about it. Neural crest migrations are what are creating these ganglia. The segmental locations to, to blood vessels, to somatic blood vessels back into the wall, all those sympathetic trunk ganglia, that was following blood vessels back into the wall. The prevertebral ganglia, celiac, super mesenteric, inferior mesenteric, aortical renal, they were following the blood vessels, foregut, midgut, hindgut, renal arteries to the gut tube and the urogenital ridge. And then the gut tube ganglia, which are really not even ganglia, they're kind of hidden in the wall, those intramural postganglionic neurons. See, they migrated down all the way to innervate that smooth muscle of the gut tube. So there it is. There's the entire peripheral spinal nervous system. And you know that by just understanding that simple, elegant plan of crest cells, stain put, migrating, ventral tube cells, and this is what you hook up and form. So that is the postcranial spinal nerve anatomy completely understood. I have posed a few final questions. How are cranial and spinal nerves related or are they? Which group is more derived, cranial nerve or spinal nerves? Now we don't have time to do that. This is a beautiful story, just a phenomenal story. And I'm gonna leave you with a little, <coughs> little teaser because in the May, in our, in our HAPS conference this May, I'm gonna be doing a workshop on this final part of this story. And I color some of the, what, there's eight of the 12 cranial nerves. And what I want you to see is that those red nerves, those are ventral roots. And those yellow nerves, those are dorsal roots. That's just like a dorsal root of a spinal nerve and a ventral root. But in the ventral root of a cranial nerve, there's only skeletal motor neurons. Whereas in the dorsal root, there's visceral motor, there's somatic sense, visceral sense, and then there's even some skeletal motor. So which are more derived? Which are more specialized? Which are more primitive? Well, this is a good chance to sign up for HAPS conference and attend, and I'm gonna finish this story there. So thanks for attending. Um, I hope that gives you a little better insight to peripheral nervous system and maybe even some ways to help share it to your students and make it crystal clear. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for that fantastic presentation, Mark. Uh, we really appreciate it. It was really, really beautifully animated. And before we move on to our Q&A, I'm just gonna run one last audience poll. So this question is, when do you plan to return to on-campus or in-lab teaching? Um, so there's a couple answers there and we're just curious to know uh, what our audience members are doing and uh, when they're returning um, back to campus. So as you kind of fill that out, um, I'd like to take a couple minutes to read some of the really positive comments that we've received. Um, so Anne says, thank you. Lisa says, Mark has done an outstanding job. He did not disappoint, um, which is no surprise. Um, we've got Noah saying, great lecture, Mark. Always inspiring to watch a master at his craft. Um, and then Baran has said, absolutely wonderful, thank you. And how many chapters do you have to cover in your anatomy class? So we'll get to those questions a little bit later. Um, and thanks so much for answering that poll, everyone. All right, Mark, are you back with us? I'm here, Sarah. Great. Okay. Um, so lots of positive comments, and we have a ton of questions. Um, so we are going to kick off the Q&A right now. If you're ready. I'm set.
Okay, perfect. So the very first question we have here is, why is there no autonomic innervation from C1 to C8 and L2 to S1? Yeah, that's a great question. And again, this goes back to, again, the, the you have to understand that our bodies are part of a big evolutionary story in our vertebrate family. And that all this stuff really starts back 500 million years ago with the very first vertebrates, the fishes. And so just like we saw that yolk sac, we don't really have a really functional yolk sac, right? I mean, we're tied into mom, into a uterine wall and kind of modify it. But you got to remember that everything started nourishment wise through a yolk sac. We still have one. We've just annexed a little different variation on how to get our nourishment. But all the things we have are parts of an ancient evolutionary past. And we don't throw them completely aside. They're still really key in our development story and who we become and what we become. And one of the cool things you have to realize, if you look at the early origins of the autonomic system, they were just like we see cranial sacral and thoracolumbar or more central part of the embryo on the two ends because of that yolk sac and where the gut tube was developing and where the vessels were developing. But they were right against each other. So the cranial end went a little into the cervical. Then you started the sympathetic. Then it went into the parasympathetic at the caudal end. And there were no gaps. There were no gaps in those earliest vertebrates. But guess what? It's kind of cool. When do you think the gaps arose? Anyone? I guess you can't really talk to me, but guess when the gaps arose? And it's such a neat story because you see it. It's when the limbs start to form and when the limb buds get big and there's big dominant skeletal muscle anatomy heading out into the limb bud the autonomics get pushed to either side of it. And so you, those areas where you start to see limb bud formation, some way crowd out the autonomics to either side. And so there's where we see the gaps now in vertebrates that have bigger, more well-developed limbs like ourselves. Pretty cool. So cool. Really cool. Okay, so uh, hopefully that answered your question and I'm going to move on um, to another question here. So this person has asked, why does the ser sorry, why does the parasympathetic system innervate the heart if you say it only innervates the smooth muscle of the gut tube? Yeah, and so this again, it goes back to, the, I mean, anciently in the really ancient beginnings of the vertebrate body, we saw this very simple pattern. But we can look at our anatomy now and I can say, OK, I know sympathetic also does my sweat glands, my erector pili muscles, in addition to blood vessels. Right. And, and, and it's gone into other places. And I can say, oh, my parasympathetic. Well, I know it, it does my heart and it does some of the genital stuff. But those are areas where it could get. Why, why don't you ever see parasympathetic out anywhere in the body wall? Because it was never there. There were never pathways there. So that's why glands, sweat glands, erector pili muscles, anything in my body wall has to be sympathetically innervated because it was the only system that was ever there based on the origins of the system. Whereas, the heart was right in there by the gut tube. Some of the genital stuff that the parasympathetic can do is because that's an outgrowth of the gut tube. You know, the urogenital system forms from part of the gut tube. I mean, part of the urogenital system comes from gut tube anatomy. And so it's areas where we have that potential overlap, where over millions of years of evolution, we could then annex multiple control systems into an area. And so like the heart's a great example as 
vertebrates came bigger and we needed more control of our blood pumping and activity levels. Now we had two systems, one that could speed up the heart and one that could slow it down because we could annex both of those nervous systems onto this organ because it was possible because they were both potentially right there. But you don't see any parasympathetic stuff out in the limbs or out in the body wall because it was never there. And so you have to use what's there, see? So there's this nice logic. That's fantastic. Uh, we're going to move on to our next question. So this question is from Corey. Corey has asked, do you have a stance or some thoughts regarding the idea that we should consider pelvic autonomics to be sympathetic rather than parasympathetic? Yeah, and again, I think there's that. that's a, a recent um, thing that was brought up. And I think um, people, again, who really understand and how we're, how we're describing this, um, realize that you have sacral, what we're going to call a parasympathetic, a cranial sacral distribution that goes to the gut tube. You know, that's classically what you would call parasympathetic. But there's also true sympathetics down there. There's sympathetics everywhere. I mean, the sympathetic system, that's the widespread system because anywhere there's a blood vessel, you're going to have sympathetic system. The sympathetic system over 500 million years of evolution has been able to adapt and do some things to the gut also. Why? Because it was always going there through blood vessels. So there's still anatomically a parasympathetic component, what we would call the cranial sacral component down there in the pelvic region, right? And then there's sympathetic that spreads into the everywhere. I mean, sympathetic's everywhere. So it, it's just, again, going back to really understanding the origins of this system evolutionarily, developmentally, and then how we've named them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, before we move on to a couple more questions, because we are getting a ton of questions and comments, I just wanted to bring everyone's attention to a survey that we have. Uh, while we're doing this Q&A, we'd really appreciate if you could fill out the survey. Um, and with that, I will move on to our next question. So this question is from Nicole. Um, is it safe to assume that the number of somites match the number of cranial and spinal nerves, one for each level of the body, so to speak? Yeah, good question, Nicole. Not, not quite. I mean, there's a series of pre-cervical somites, right, that we, that we call the occipital somites that um, get associated more with the cranial nerves and some of the head development. So those are going to be involved with, um, you know, up at that head end. And then there's a group of somites towards the tail end that where you have more initially, but then the tail really regresses. I mean, we had a nice little tail when we were in embryos, but that really starts to regress. And those somites um, don't develop to the same degree as that tail regresses. You go through some apoptosis, you know, program cell death down in there. And those, those somites really reduce. And so in the embryonic somite count, there's a few more, more than what we end up with as vertebrae and spinal nerves and body segments in the end, just because how things develop and regress. Cool. Um, just a reminder, if you do have any questions for Mark, please use the Ask a Question panel to submit them. Um, we have tons to go through, but I just wanted to make you aware that he will be filling out a Q&A report, which means he will type out answers to all of your questions, even if we don't get to them to live today. Um, so submit any questions that you have, and he will take a look at them. And our next question is from Wendy. Wendy has asked, I'm curious how much embryology you teach undergrad or lower division anatomy students. Hi, Wendy, great question. And I, I, um, I, I teach them, I mean, I'm a believer, just like I tried to show here, that if I can just understand a little bit of developmental anatomy, enough to make me dangerous as a student, 
I can understand a lot more. So I, I help them understand that basic vertebrate body plan because from that, I can build every muscle really easily. And I can build, you know, from the somites. I can help them understand how the gut tube pushes into the coelom and why we have these coelomic membranes, you know, why there's a visceral and a parietal and a mesentery. I can help them understand, because you saw where those urogenital ridges were, why the kidneys are retroperitoneal, you know, and don't have a mesentery, <coughs> excuse me, like a, like a gut organ. I can help them understand this pattern of muscles in the wall. Because like I showed you, that hypaxial muscle forms a subvertebral mass, a four-layer lateral wall, and a ventral muscle. And I can show now those six muscles in the neck, in the thorax, in the abdomen, in the pelvis. That's all the muscles we learn, and they come from those six. Now that they know those patterns, now they see why the nerves, why there's a dorsal ramus and a ventral ramus. And as I understand these little migrations, I've set up the whole nervous system. So up in the head, I, if I understand those branchial arches, those are kind of like the somites of the head that now I know why, hey, this cranial nerve goes to these muscles because they came from that arch. This cranial nerve goes to these muscles because they came from that arch. So I give them a little developmental overview enough knowledge base that when I then teach the anatomy, I keep reiterating that. See, that comes from this, that comes from this. Let's build it from this. And then everything starts to make sense so logically, and they don't have all these why questions. Why, 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 well, look at it, we answered it. Now you know why. And so, trust me, I've been doing it for 35 years, and you don't have to get all caught up in tons of developmental anatomy. You give them the foundation principles, you establish a little development out of that, and the body makes so much sense. That's a really awesome way to approach it, I think. Um, as someone who did anatomy myself in undergrad, uh, it's a lot of memorization, and I feel like if you can find logical ways to remember um, the anatomy, then students will do better and they'll learn faster and they'll retain that information longer. So that's really, really awesome, Mark. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of my arguments. I mean, I, we always emphasize so much lately, flipped classrooms, active learning, blah, blah, blah. But then we just have them watch something that they have to memorize, then we come and help them reinforce how they memorized. I'm a believer that we want to show them how to learn. Why is the learning logical? Why does this structure make sense? How does it come about? And when I can see that, then it's not just a lecture here, memorize this. Even if I now want to do a flipped classroom, at least I've given them now the ability to think about it better. So when they come back, now let's ask those questions and see how we think it through. So absolutely, it's so important to see not just teach them this is this, this is this, this is this, memorize it, help them see the logic in this. It, it, we're going to build it. We're going to build it. If I watch a building get built, I understand that building a lot better than if I just come and look at a built building. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's why this is so critical. Yeah, that's really awesome. All right, we have time for one more question. Um, this question comes from Karen. Karen has asked, why are preganglionic neurons myelinated and the postganglionic neurons not myelinated? Yeah, another pretty good question there. And, and one of the things you, you really need to see is, again, as the cells are developing, remember these are these crest cells, and the, the migratory crest cells move away from the rest of the crest population. So that crest population that stays put, that's where the glial cells are developing that help myelinate. And as those crest cells that move away to become the postganglionics 
in, where they're seeking the smooth muscle developing in blood vessels in the gut tube, see, they move away from those glial cells that can myelinate them. And so they never get myelinated. See, that's another great understanding point here. Whereas when you're back up in that crest population, see the glial cells weren't migratory cells. And so then they surround the sensory neurons. So you have many myelinated sensory neurons, but not those postganglionics. See, they migrate away and never get that chance to get myelinated. Good question. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, so Mark, I wanted to thank you again for your awesome presentation, your really cool animations, and then also your insights um, during the Q&A. So thank you again. You're welcome. I've just enjoyed it. And I, I love to share things about anatomy. And so I hope everyone uh, found some of that beneficial. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. So um, thank you everyone who attended. Um, we really appreciate your support. And again, a recording of today's webinar will be available soon. So look out for an email giving you access to that recording. And if there's anyone that you want to share that recording with, you can send them to the landing page for the webinar and they can register to watch that on demand. Um, as I said before, please participate in the survey. Um, and finally, if you have any questions um, or comments for Mark, please use that Ask a Question panel again to submit those. And if you're curious about the upcoming events in the series, you can see them here on this slide. Um, we have two more fantastic webinars and we've posted the first event on demand. Um, that was Dr. Tony McKnight. Um, so don't forget to check that out if you missed it. He goes all or he goes over all of the awesome ways that you can future proof your teaching um, for the 2021 virtual era. And in closing, thank you again for taking a part in this webinar, and we look forward to having you with us again soon.